Oh, man. As usual, way more material than is possible to share, so we're just going to run through a bunch of things. Uh, but first, just what is a witch? What is a witch? What does the word mean to you? When you hear witch, what associations do you have? A strong woman. Magic. A strong woman. Magic. Intuition. Intuition. Outsider. What? Outsider. Cats and brooms. An outsider. Cats and brooms. Wisdom. 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 Shaman. Hunts. Witch hunts. Transforming. Medicine man. Medicine man. Medicine woman. Transformation. Alternative. Old religions. Old religions. Lady in a pointy black hat. Lady in a pointy black hat. What else? Fire. Fire. Altar. Goddess. Altar. Altar. Move energy. Move energy. Cauldrons, frogs. Rituals. Cauldrons and frogs. Plant medicine. Rituals, plant medicines. A wart on her nose. A wart on the nose, which the goes with the tall black hat. What? Ah! Wait, the, the sound. Lesbians. Hag. Hag. Red hair. Red hair. <laughs> you Ruby witch. Slippers. <laughs> Ruby slippers. Sisterhood. Sisterhood. Outcast. Outcast. Feminism. Feminism. Ritual. Looking to the future. Rituals. Looking to the future. Scarlet leather. Divination. What? Scarlet leather. Scarlet leather. Scarlet leather. Inquisition. 
Inquisition. Total bitch. Total bitch. Frightened Christians. Frightened Christians. Burning. 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 Salem. Salem. Occultism. Occultism. Prehistory wisdom. Prehistory wisdom. Truth. Truth. Power rooted in the earth as well. Say again. Coming from the earth. Coming from the earth. Poison apples. Poison apples on Halloween. My grandmother. My grandmother. My mother. Noses. Big noses. All right. So we have some things down. Um, what's a bitch? Where do you get that word? Do you use it? Do you not use it? What does it mean? A female dog. A female dog. Okay, there's the translation. A horny female dog. What? A horny. A horny female dog. Okay. A nasty woman. A nasty woman. Defiant, I heard. Do you know what defiant means? Somebody who is that resistance, somebody, defiant is someone who does not obey the rules or the norms of a situation, is defiant. Loud. Loud. A bitch is loud. A badass. A badass. Obnoxious. Obnoxious. Rude. Rude. Mean. Mean. Angry. Angry. Someone who speaks up. Someone who speaks up. Joy. <laughs> <laughs> Selfish. Selfish. You selfish bitch. <coughs> that, one can hurt. That, one, that one can hurt. Rude, yeah. Caddy. Caddy. Can it also be submissive in some context? No. Yes. No. No. <laughs> yes, no. Okay. Effusive. Abusive. Abusive. Double standard. That's what I think of for sure. Talking. Talking. Um, unapologetic. Unapologetic. Wow. Bitches are unapologetic. Gossiping. Why was Nina Simone always called a bitch? Diva. Yeah. Attention. Female hustler. Female hustler. Honest. Dominant. Powerful. Outspoken. Outspoken. Why was Hillary Clinton called a bitch for four years? Female in power. Yeah. A woman in power. Bad politics. Bad politics? <laughs> yeah. Who are the most famous bitches now? Margaret Thatcher. <laughs> Margaret Thatcher has a special role in bitch history, it's true. And it's complicated because a lot of it is actually just because she had power and was outspoken and defiant. It's quite complicated. As soon as, same with Hillary Clinton, right? But who are the other big bitches today? Beyonce. Beyonce's a bitch? No, no she's not a bitch. She's a diva. Nicki Minaj. Nicki Minaj is much the more. The Kardashians. The Kardashians, in a way, they want to be bitches. Which is another category. They wish, yeah. Madonna was a bitch. Madonna was a bitch? And was she a bitch early in her career? Not really, you think? No, I think she grew into it. Why is Yoko Ono a bitch? She broke up the Beatles. <laughs> two reasons. Yoko Ono's a bitch for two reasons. She broke up the Beatles, and why else? She made weird art. She screamed in her art. Yeah. All right. I think that's enough of that. Um, you're going to have to look at my notes because um, I had to download all of these in every video because um, what is a bitch? Yeah, okay, so let's just do this one for a second. What are the insults for women in your language? Besides, so we've got bitch. Vaca. Vaca, which means cow. What are there, the insults for women? Puta. Puta, which means whore. Slut. Slut. Whore. Tramp. What? Tramp. Tramp. Cunt. Cunt. Skank. Vagia. Vagia. Just vagina? No. Someone, like, it's 
kind of like a chant, someone who has nothing to do, and it's just like... Vajia. <laughs> what does that mean? Goat. Oh, we have it in German too. You also have it in German? Sieger. Goat. Millie. Millie, what's that? Millie is like a Belfast bitch with big earrings. And she's like, you know what I mean? Like, you know, they can only guess here or two little. Wow. Trash. Trash. Salop. Salop. Putain. Lula. Putain. Sec. Sec? That's sec. A sec. What's that mean? Sick. 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 A sack. Like a bag. Like a bag. Like a bag. You sack. You old sack. You peg. Gold digger. A gold digger. Ooh. So, we all understand these words, witch and bitch. And what I want to uh, sort of get some other language on the table about what is appropriation or reappropriation or even detournement. Détournement. So I'm looking at ways that we have these words, they're insulting to women, they're meant to hurt, and then there are some women who take them back on, or there are some gay men who take them on, which adds a whole layer of complexity about what's going on with the word. Um, a lot of what I want to do today is give a little bit just more weight to the way witch and bitch get used in this community this week and this summer, right? Um, Many of you don't have English as a first language, so there's already this adoption or... And then many of you, your experience of bitch is coming through contemporary hip-hop. Um, a lot of that is coming out of African-American culture in the U.S. and then is being impacted, especially by the way that bitch is being sort of reappropriated or taken back by women and queers. And then how that influence, I mean, especially black women and black queers, um, and the way that then comes back into pop culture, and then we all start to use the word because we're all in this language together. And I want that to just be a bit more complicated than um, I think it is. Someone translate uh, détournement. Mm. Like, short pause. Is Salik in the house? Yeah. Can you record this? Not going to be a great recording, but I... Oh, anyway, don't worry about it. I wrote it all out, and you can all have it online. No, Mark is recording. Yeah, Mark. 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 Mark is also. So, detournement. What's detournement? Some Frenchy. Is it like un unturning or unwinding? Sure, <coughs> why not? Yeah. 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 To, to, to turn around. To turn around. Yeah, turn around. So, the word, we get the word in terms of political use from the situationists, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah. Manu, is that, you're saying yes? I said yes. Jess? Yes. Um, so, the idea is to take something and turn it around, and for the situation is, at first, you know, this I'm talking the 60s, Paris, um, it's the idea where you're fed one kind of political speech, and you turn it around to try to use it against itself. Right? It's when you take the comics, and then you change the little bubble, and the woman says, oh no, I forgot to have a baby but that's not really what the original comic was, <laughs> right? That's a detournement. <laughs> or if you record politicians speaking and you take out the language and then you put in, no, I'm going to kill you. No, I'm going to kill all your children. Oh, I'm going to kill all the children of your children's children or something like that. That would be a detournement. It would be a, it would be a really bad one, but that would be a detournement. So I'm just saying that there are ways that we use language where there's taking back language that's used against you and then using it as a kind of power. Um, words like nigger and queer are in this category. It's complicated how we use them, but they are part of this. It's a word that's meant to hurt somebody, and then people take it back and then self-identify and then use that as a kind of power to say, you can't hurt me with that word. And actually, in fact, I'm going to fuck you up by using it, uh, even against you. Because now who's the real faggot? Now, it's not me. It's you who's afraid of being a faggot. So... How do we use words? How do we take them on? Bitch. Why is bitch such a popular word? Who has reclaimed or reframed bitch? Um, again, I want to sort of complicate our relationship to global hip-hop, to global pop in a way. Right? So we hear this all the time. The word bitch is now... It went from being this word... Oh, one thing I'll just say, just to go backwards, is that... Um, 
there's for certain young people today, this speech, which includes many of you, this lecture is almost <laughs> ridiculous. Like it's like a history, it's not just a history lesson, but it's actually anachronistic. Like it's ahistorical for me to even try to do this. But I'm schooled in 70s and early 80s feminism, so I have to do this. I can't come to this camp and hear bitch, 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 or use bitch all the time and not also bring this my whole self of where I come from and how I was really told to never use this word and then I watched it change and then we had to figure out how to operate in a place where we thought we were actually going to take this word out of the language or take even this idea that you could attack women with language or attack all people by calling them women. So from, that's why I'm doing this. Um, history. So everyone knows that there's no correct history. We're all there. You're all happening people. This is a very subversive, subversive. This is a very subjective exercise. Um, it's my history that I'm going to try and share with you. Um, you know, one of the things that we say about history is that history is told by the winners. So in giving a bitch history, I'm also trying to give the history of outcasts and the history of power in a different kind of way. Um, a lot of this uh, way that I'm going to try and teach this is trying to go into what I think some of the, the famous bitches are that, from where we get this idea of a bitch as a powerful woman. But at the same time, I won't be speaking about a lot of the famous bitches in your country or in your communities. Um, so I'm just apologizing in advance that I don't know all those people. I want to just to throw, can I throw down something? Before sure. You go all the way into it. I just want to say one thing real quick, which is that last year, you guys probably know about this, there was witch camp. Some people were here. Yes. And, um, and there was this, and I was here and I was playing music for Meg Stewart, and she was teaching with this witch named Lexi, who was doing some, some cool stuff, but a lot of stuff with that some of us and myself, I found really just like very much the same you know, she's like, I'm a high priestess, and this is how magic happens, and, and doing the same invocations every single time. And then there was this shaman guy here who was, like, charging 250, you know, euros for these sessions. I was like, who's this guy? He's like, like, you know, what does he do in there? But he just lays on the bed and holds your hand, and he falls asleep, and then he wakes up and tells you what he saw, and then you give him 250 bucks. And anyway, I was out there, you know, a few days had gone by, I was like, and I was like, you know, bitching about, like, what's going on, but also, you know, just kind of throwing down some, you know, my personal bitching about how things were going, and I was just kind of riffing on stuff, and I was like, this year's witch camp, but next year we should do bitch camp as a joke. It was totally a joke, but it was just kind of, you know, busting a rhyme and kind of just <laughs> expressing it like that, and then a, a couple of months later, Stephanie, where are you? Are you here? I'm here. Cool. Then Stephanie, like, sends me an email. Yeah, let's do bitch camp. <laughs> and I was like, that's fucking crazy! I was just like, eating lunch, just like complaining, you know? <laughs> and then we just started writing back and forth. Anyway, just a little history of how bitch camp came to be. Partially, I'm just taking credit. But in another way, just saying like, wow. And then we started to write and started to be more serious. And thank you, Stephanie, for like taking this riffing and making it into something serious. And thank you, Keith, for be being scholarly and throwing it out. And the seed has already been planted for Butch Camp. Yes! yes. 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 Butch Camp. Yeah. Butch Camp. Butch Camp. Yeah. All right. Uh, so, I was just going, I apologize for not knowing all the bitches in your country. And Jules reminds us that the verb to bitch means to complain, right? So, this is also comes from this same idea. An outspoken woman is seen as a complainer and therefore is a bitch. And so, therefore, the verb to bitch, we were bitching, I was bitching about, means that I was complaining. But we use that word again as this way to say that women should be seen and not heard, etc. And then so. the last Keith interjection, and then I'll shut up the real thing, was that in, in our life, this into a real thing because it's going to happen, you know? It started off as this, and then it was like, and I was writing about well, how does the bitch become the diva, become the queen? And then we started riffing on that, and then this, so I think that feeds into, like, I, I see Aretha Franklin up there or something. Or, Oh, yeah. We just did her. Okay. But yes, we'll come back. <laughs> Actually, Aretha Franklin. <laughs> what? What? <laughs> Babe. So, I'm just going to keep going, otherwise we're going to run. <laughs>
<laughs> so I wrote here, I want to complicate the way that African Americans, especially black women and queers, are used by many of us, white or non-African American artists, for our inspiration. So what does it mean to look to other people for inspiration, and what does it mean to sort of invest a little bit more in that project? Um, African American cultures are deeply rooted in a practice of confronting and negotiating centuries of racism. As racism and capitalism, since racism has always been an economic or a class project, as racism has evolved, so do the cultural responses of black people whose survival engages Africanist aesthetics and influences despite all efforts to cut their tie to their ancestry. Colonialism hates real history, especially the living history of the colonized. And we'll just write. Or marginalized. And so there, just another interesting piece for people to know is that um, during what we call the Middle Passage, or the you know, several hundred years of moving black bodies from the continent of Africa to the Americas and somewhat to Europe as free labor, during that process, there were different ways that black people or that Africans came to these different countries. And when they came into the continent of the United States, it was a little rougher than their movement and I think the people from Brazil can speak to their experience, Caribbeans a little bit different. But in the United States, people were separated by family and language group and tribe so that they couldn't share common language or cultural language. And that happened immediately as they landed in the United States. And it's one of the ways, one of the reasons that the way that a kind of black culture, Negro culture, black culture, Africanist culture emerged in the United States was because people had to improvise and develop new things because of these extreme limitations being put on their cultural production. So if they sang, they couldn't sing in one language because they didn't all speak the same language. They weren't allowed to drum and then then they started being allowed to drum only on Sundays if it was connected to a Christian church. So there were all of these very extreme limitations put on people that sparked very intense kinds of innovation and improvisation. So it's just to say that when we're looking at things and we love it and we celebrate it, to also not forget the struggles that they come from. And here's my proposal, which when I was talking to Hannah, I said it better, but I, I, my proposal is, rather than us imitating or appropriating black cultures, Perhaps we can be inspired to respond to our own oppression, confronting the injustices of our time, perhaps using black cultures as a model of improvising survival and resistance with whatever resources we have. Can we add an S to oppression? Sure. <laughs> I mean, even I'm tr triggered by our own oppressions, because it's, of course, to all kinds of oppressions of this moment. We don't just need to respond to our own. But it's just this idea of, like, Maybe instead of looking at the surface of what the work is that we're interested in, that we all want to learn to vogue or rap or twerk, that maybe we also look at some of the history of struggle that's in that and how those art forms are actually forms of survival and resistance, that that's the real inspiration that might spark some of the work that we might make. All right. Um, just because she's one of the most famous bitches that we should really have on the table, and many of you don't know her, um, you're nodding. So there's some people here, of course, who know Audre Lorde, but not everyone in the house. So are there any non-Americans who've heard of Audre Lorde? One or two? Yeah. So Audre Lorde was a black lesbian. Um, very important. And she was a poet. You can look at all her books. But in 1979, she was invited to a big, big feminist conference. And almost everyone there was white. And she was one of the few black people there and maybe was only, I think, one of two. Anyway, she wrote an essay, and the essay was called The Master's Tools Will Never Dismantle, which means to take apart. The Master's Tools Will Never Take Apart the Master's House. This is a debate. It's not that she's right. This is a challenge that she's putting in front of us. And what she did was she looked at white feminists and said, 
all this amazing work that you're doing, but you're still actually afraid of the people who are different from you. And you're specifically afraid of dealing with the people who are not white and the women who aren't straight. So the lesbians and the women of color. And until you can do that, you are just repeating what white patriarchy has already established as a structural social form. So if you think that you're doing something different and it looks like this, you're using the master's tools and you will never take apart the master's house. So now in the 40 or however many years since 1979, 20, 35 years, what we're doing is trying to figure out what would it mean to use different tools. Right? I'm already giving you the lecture with the computer. There's already master's tools all over the place here. So in the studio especially, but maybe some of tonight, how we present this lecture or how you intervene, maybe we're also starting to play even with master's tools here. Um, I wrote that this was a key text in the development of third wave feminism. Third wave feminism is that moment in feminism when the women of color and the lesbians say, we really need to redirect how this is going. And that moment of third wave feminism is super instrumental to many of the ideas that we all take as our contemporary ideas now, our queer studies, our post-colonial feminism. So Audre Lorde is one of our sort of grandmothers of the kind of thinking that we do today. Blah, blah, blah. Um, I will make this whole uh, piece available and the entire essay that she wrote is attached. Isadora Duncan, also a famous bitch, and this is where we start to get complicated with the modernism stuff, some of which I brought up today. These are words that were big for Isadora Duncan. Nature, woman, freedom, America, internationalism, right? These are ways that we know this is like she's a key figure of modernism. These words were the most important to her. I'm just going to read from an essay. I also tried to find different ways of these Americans in Europe. So that, uh, that version of Aretha Franklin was in Sweden, in Stockholm, in 1968. This is the speech that uh, Isadora gave in Berlin in 1903. There will always be movements which are the perfect expression of that individual body and that individual soul. So we must not force it to make movements which are not natural to it. Um, the dancer of the future will be one whose body and soul have grown so harmoniously together that the natural language of the soul will have the movement of the body. The dancer will not belong to a nation, but to all humanity. She will dance not in the form of a nymph, nor a fairy, nor a coquette, but in the form of a woman in its greatest and purest expression. She will realize the mission of woman's body and the holiness of all its parts. She will dance the changing life of nature, showing how each part is transformed into one another. From all parts of her body shall shine radiant intelligence, bringing to the world the message of the thoughts and aspirations of thousands of women. She shall dance the freedom of women. This is the mission of the dance of the future. She is coming, the dancer of the future the free spirit who will inhabit the body of new women, more glorious than any woman that has yet been, more beautiful than all women in past centuries, the highest intelligence in the freest body. In this complicated text is actually some of the root foundations of what we're doing here. No matter how complicated this is, no matter how much it leads to a, a bunch of ideas about what a woman is and what internationalism is and what it means to erase difference and say we're all one, um, even just her complicated ideas about what women are versus what anyone else is. But at the same time, I know that you recognize some of the, in this text, some of what brings us to the work that we do about being free, about being free in our body, about not enforcing a particular movement on anyone's body. Um, in 1903, she gave that speech. There was really no context for her to give that um, outside of these very burgeoning, right? So this is first wave feminism is turn of the century, late 1800s, early 1900s, and she rides that wave. These are just a bunch of quotes from Isadora. We won't discuss them. I'm just going to say them. You can hear them and do what you want with them. If I could tell you what, I me what it meant, there would be no point in dancing it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> 
one of my mottos also, you were once wild here, don't let them tame you. The dancer's body is simply the luminous manifestation of the soul. Any intelligent woman who reads the marriage contract and then goes into it deserves all the consequences. And then after she got married, she said, after her first divorce, she said, so that ends my first experience of matrimony, which I always thought a highly overrated performance. Uh, if you don't know, Isadora Duncan, for most of her career, once she started, gave a speech before she danced every night. A dance about the importance of educating girl ch children, about the importance of the revolution in Russia and why it should be supported by the United States, about the, how marriage was disgusting. She gave a speech every night before she danced. The finest in... Oh, most human beings today waste some 25 to 30 years of their lives before they break through the actual and conventional lies which surround them. Whoa. The finest inheritance you can give to a child is to allow it to make its own way, completely on its own feet, which we actually see a lot here. And then we get some more complicated Isadora. It seems to me monstrous that anyone should believe that the jazz rhythm expresses America. Jazz rhythm expresses the primitive savage. And so this is just a little peek into this gaping void of racism that modernism was constantly engaged with, right? So Isadora felt a lot of competition from the other sort of cultural explosions of the era that she was in. And so she was constantly distancing herself from the Josephine Bakers, from the jazz music, from these other versions of what free individual spirit might look like. Um, very messy. Vigman, we're not going to look at Vigman because we did it today. Uh, Josephine Baker, um, so much we could say. Maybe we look at, uh, we'll just look at a very sh quick video. It's not the original music for this video. So I'll just pause for a second and say, after the ballet body, there has been this descent through the body of trying to sort of like reclaim, like first the sternum, right? You know, Isadora was very here, and then Graham got us down to the belly. Um, and it's really not in terms of white dancing, it's not until contact that, and sort of these release forms that we actually re sort of recommit to the pelvis. But simultaneous to all this is a giant project in black dance that's going through the whole century. And Josephine Baker is both shifting how dance hall and pop dance is, at the same time as being amused to the whole fine artist scene of the early 20s in Paris, the sort of break moment of modernism. So um, just watch her dancing and then imagine that it's mostly white society people are watching her. Again, this is not the original music. <laughs> Right, so you can see different kinds of dance histories in the movement, wow. but you're also Great. watching really uh, her own thing happening here too. 
And she was a huge diva. I mean, in the Western world, she was one of the most famous women in the world at this time. This is 1927, I think. It's, she's already pretty famous here. tiny bit of Josephine Baker. So, um, almost the only original theater form to really come from the United States, although it's complicated to even say that, is minstrel or blackface. And I'm not going to give you a whole history of it, but it's, in, it's for those people who know what I'm talking about, it's, it started with um, having black people perform as Negroes. So they had Negro people performing as slaves. Um, they would put, they would burn charcoal, uh, burn cork, and make their face black, and then it just became black makeup. And they would make this very characterized, like they would make a mask of a joke of a black face, and then they would <coughs> perform the wacky stereotypes blown out of proportion about what white people already thought about black people. And then over time, white people started to also perform blackface. And in sort of mid-1800s, late-1800s, especially late-1800s, even into the early 19s, who do you think were the two ethnic communities who were the most likely to be white people performing blackface in the United States? Jews. Jews and? Irish. The Irish. That's right. <laughs> so one of the ways that people became white in the United States when they weren't considered white, like Jews or Irish, was by being the front lines of racism, whether that meant becoming the police and the firemen, like the Irish, or um, doing the blackface performance in the vaudeville halls and things like that. So there's a way where you can look at a lot of black pop today, or even Josephine Baker in the 20s, as performing an exotic black person for white people, giving them back the expectations that they have of this free, liberated, primitive tribal person, and then... The part where you have to become a famous bitch is when you have to figure out how do I reappropriate the white gaze, right? The white look that's upon me. How do I take that back and still have some sense of agency or free expression? And that's where Josephine Baker played a razor edge. Um, and we'll see that throughout some of this stuff that we're going to look at. Um, what else did I write about Baker? A major muse at a key moment in modern art history. She danced primarily for white audiences in Paris, a city which for years was famous for supporting and or exploiting American Negro, black artists, dancers, musicians, painters, writers. How is Baker both a modernist innovator and a participant in her own black exploitation? Black plus exploitation. Just some things to weigh around. Um, there's a number of famous bitches in a whole bunch of time. I'm not covering them. Martha Graham. Martha Graham rewrote the myths that we had sort of accepted as these foundational myths of Europe, and she rewrote them as dances with female protagonists. So always female lead characters, with her always playing the lead. So you can look at this as crazy narcissism, but you also need to see it additionally as a feminist resistance strategy of not only the personal is political, but of rewriting sort of foundational history from a female point of view and inserting strong women into um, sort of our inherited European history. Catherine Dunham. Catherine Dunham was an African-American dancer who also went through grad school very early, uh, got a master's degree in anthropology, spent many years studying in uh, the Caribbean. Um, I'm not sure where. Haiti. Yeah, but not just Haiti, because she came back with a whole slew. Maybe Trinidad and Tobago, also Haiti. Um, and then she developed a, f a technique form named after her called Dunham Technique, which is a meeting point of modern dance practice and Africanist dances from the Caribbean. But also in the States, if you go and take an Af Afro-Haitian class, it's Dunham Technique. Yes. Uh, and then just another famous bitch of this kind of era that I'm doing 30s into 40s, Frida Kahlo, 
uh, someone who was surrounded by major figures in male art and political history. Uh, she maintained her visibility with experimental and innovative approaches to self-portraiture. Again, a really interesting sort of early personal is political kind of work. So I know that you've all seen a picture somewhere of, by Frida Kahlo. So just to drop her into our history of famous <coughs> bitches. Um, I'm going to play a song by Nina Simone. Most of you have heard it. She wrote it in 1963. It's called Mississippi Goddamn. And it's a really powerful song. She's amazing. She sings it in a cool style. So her rage often, and this is true with Nina Simone in much of her career, her rage is right under the surface, which is again an Africanist sort of aesthetic in the United States, which is cool, which is you play just below the intense passion that you're feeling for, and then you have to sort of feel her in that. So um, you can, some of you may or may not recognize the song as extremely angry. The year that she wrote it, there were two really important murder events that she was responding to. One was the killing of Edgar, Med um, Medgar Evers, who was a black activist, had just come, who had been a soldier in the American army. He was now a black activist working for black power, or, which was then at that time civil rights, and he was killed by a white supremacist group, an actual group that believed in white power. In the same year, a church in Birmingham, <coughs> Alabama, that was a place where many meetings for activists happened, that church was bombed, and four s girls, four young girls were killed. And that, it took years for them to actually even decide to try to find who did it. And when they did it, the men who were involved were all members of the KKK, which was a white supremacist organization, still is a white supremacist organization in the United States. So let's just listen to her. We'll watch her sing this song for a moment. How are you doing? Am I talking too fast? Great. 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 I know it's really bad video. Alabama's got me so upset. Tennessee made me lose my rest. Everybody knows about Mississippi Goddamn. Alabama's got me so upset. The whole damn world is making me lose my rest. Everybody knows about Mississippi Goddamn. Can't you see it? Can't you feel it? It's all in the air. I can't stand the pressure much longer. Somebody say a prayer. Alabama's got me so upset. The whole damn world is making me lose my rest. Everybody knows about this is in the garden. You can shake if you want. Hound dogs on my trail. School children sitting in jail. Black cat past my path. I think every day is gonna be my last. Lord have mercy on this land of mine We all gonna get it in due time I don't belong here, I don't belong there I've even stopped believing in prayer Very cool Don't tell me, I'll tell you Me and my people just about do I've been there, so I know They keep on saying, go slow You keep on saying, go slow Take Well, it easy. that's just the trouble go slow. Washing the windows go slow. Picking the cotton go slow. You're just plain rotten go slow. Too damn lazy you think thinking's crazy Picket lines, 
school boycotts They try to say it's a communist block But all I want is equality For my sisters, my brothers, my people and me You lied to me all these years You told me to wash and clean my ears Talk real fine just like a lady They'd stop calling my mother Sister Sadie But my country is full of lies We all gonna die and die like flies I don't trust it anymore Keep on saying so slow That's just the trouble Unification Do things gradually Will bring more tragedy Why don't you feel it? Why don't you see it? I don't know I don't know You don't have to live next to me Just give me my equality Everybody knows about Mississippi Everybody knows about Alabama Everybody knows about Margaret Thatcher Everybody knows about Jesse Jackson Everybody knows about Ronald Reagan Everybody knows about Mississippi Stop calling my mother Sister Sadie. Do you know what that is a reference to? You know I don't, do you? I do, I do not. <laughs> they use that what? Yeah. Um, okay, let's just keep moving. Um, Yoko Ono, super famous bitch. Um, I wrote, millions think that Yoko is a major bitch. You just need to follow any comments on the internet around Yoko Ono. It's insane how they attack. It's incredible. Including just the constant stuff about the Beatles. Um, but also, any time that it's about her singing. Um, so I just wrote, fuck those haters. From the Fluxus films to her innovations with experimental music, ritualized performance, and participatory installation, Yoko Ono is a serious bitch. Uh, you've all seen Cut Piece, right? Yeah. yeah. So, do we watch it just for like one second? Just to... <coughs> I've never seen it. I've never seen it. Some of you have never seen it. Well, one of the most well known performers that we did actually by Yoko Ono. Uh, it's quite iconic, uh, this piece of work. I'm going to take out this woman's voice even though I like it. So, someone else besides me describe this piece. What happened? Yoko sits on stage with clothes on and. Uh, invites people in the audience to come up and there's scissors on the stage and they can uh, start to cut her clothing and slowly make her naked. Anyone want to say anything else about this piece? 1965. I think, maybe 63 or 4. <coughs> it's been quoted a million times, it gets taught in performance classes and feminist classes. Um, <laughs> Some people read uh, a real comment on the ways people treat female bodies in this piece. Uh, there's other people who read it also in terms of how the Asian female is read and what her role is in terms of the public or private. Um, and the war in Vietnam also. And say about that? Just like uh, the pictures people saw with all the, yeah, I mean, the Asian women and children running. Yeah, we're sitting there Wait, can you say it louder? She's saying that for her there's a reference also to the images that we got from Vietnam of these people with exposed flesh and cutaway clothes. Doesn't this predate that war? Yeah. No. Well, it's... When's Vietnam? Yeah. This is 1964, this performance. But Korea starts in the 50s. I mean, there's just... I don't know if that's necessarily what she was responding to. 
Um, there are there are times when people cut her hair or went to cut her skin. Um, she did it again, even at the age of eighty, as a kind of protest piece uh, for the what was happening in Iraq. She did it just a few years ago in Paris. Supposedly, people were much nicer to her. She has a huge body of work that's actually really inspiring to me and many others. It's worth checking out. Um, so let's jump to some punk rock. Um, one of my early heroes was Polystyrene from the band X-Ray Specs. Um, and I wrote, punk, despite being dominated by rude white boys, cracked open and continues to crack open here and there, at least temporarily, the politeness of bourgeois society of capitalist rock and roll, of the racism and sexism and homophobia of pop. Um, polystyrene was an explosive force in early punk. I, didn't, I picked her really because of the song, but it's also interesting that at a time when um, there were very few people of color, um, in, for sure, well, there always have been very few people of color in uh, some scenes, but um, she had a, her father was from Somalia, and... Uh, her mother was Irish Scotch mix. Oh, what They're happens? not home. I'm gonna wait. <laughs> Little girls should ah. be seen and not home. I just want everyone to get that. Everyone hears the opening line. What is it? Say it. Little girls should be seen and not heard. Right. So this is sort of like one of these things that we carry on. Little girls should be seen but not heard. And the, if you can't understand the lyrics, she says, well, I say, oh, bondage, up yours. <laughs> this is 1977, so... Little girls should be seen and not heard. Oh, bondage, up yours! When they break up! Does everyone know what up yours means? <laughs> what does it mean, up yours? People who don't know. Fuck you. Yeah, fuck you. In the butt, up your butt, right? <laughs> well, <laughs> wherever. It's the, up yours is the translation of this gesture. But it, she's saying, oh, bondage, like bondage, slavery, fuck you. That's, she's singing over and over again. Uh, with a number of really fun lyrics. I mean, just to say, she's also one of the very early people to just fully go day glow and not dress either hippie or in all black. Um, all right, then I did this crazy thing where I was like, 
once I started listing bitches of performance art, I was like, we're not doing all of these people. But I just thought I would name some. Um, and again, any of these women, I'm sure if one part of the art scene was referring to them as a bitch at any other moment. Um, Valley Export, Nikki de saint Fal, Sylvester. Who's Jan Sylvester? Sylvester is a, is a queer, is a gay diva of disco. Janis Joplin, Carolee Schneeman, um, Judy Chicago, Angela Davis, Dance Noise. Who's Dance Noise? Dance Noise was a duo of uh, women, a duo of women. Two women who had an amazing sort of performance art dance band together in New York in the 80s. Um, amazing. Uh, Movement Research did an entire journal on them. It's really worth checking out. Karen Finley, Joan Jett, The Au Pairs, Nina Hagen, Jennifer Monson and Dee Dee Dorvillier. I was thinking especially of that piece they do with the leather jackets, their 80s piece. It was an awe. Yeah, it's awesome. Adrienne Piper, who many of you might not know because she worked more in conceptual art. Um, really some great stuff on race and gender. Uh, African-American person. Margaret Cho, the Korean-American comedian. And Neo Bustamante, because she's a friend of mine, and Jules, and Jesses, and other people here. Um, so, in the late 80s, well, maybe I'll just read this paragraph. During the late 80s, early 90s, in the U.S. and Europe, there was an angry, fabulous emergence, or emergency, of queer visibility, activism, activism, art, and cultural production. Performance art, AIDS activism, ACT UP, the Lesbian Avengers, Queer Nation, bisexual and trans people were remaking the LGBT queer political landscape, new networks for feminist and queer art and performance, the first queer performance festivals, and this text by Zoe Leonard comes out of that moment and helps to create that environment. So, I talked a little bit about it today in talking about the loss from AIDS, but at the same time how that period, especially this, um, in the latter part of the most intense decade of, of AIDS among the gay people of Europe and the US, um, there was a, just a very intense kind of queer resistance that happened. That's when we, we get the word queer from this time. Um, it had been around for a long time, but that's when it really gets grabbed onto as a different kind of identity, a different kind of strategy. Um, and, uh, yeah, I think we should just read it. We'll do a day, I think that we'll have to do a day during the week that we do manifestos and political statements, and we look from Isadora to punk rock to Zoe Leonard to Adrian Piper and other kinds of pieces, but I thought we'd just read it as a sort of choral piece. Go. I want to type for president. I want to pursue the case for president. Yell it a little louder. Louder. I want so 
So it's this kind of, and again, the thing about playing polystyrene before this is that um, it's I've done a little bit more often now, but it's amazing how often I'll go to places and they'll give some kind of history piece to try to frame contemporary art, and they won't mention punk at all. And I'm like, are you kidding? There is no contemporary art without punk. All what's happening in contemporary dance, what's happening in these things, without punk, and especially the really the marginal punks, the the black punks, the queer punks, the female punks, we wouldn't have so many other things. It's amazing this sort of hybrid of these different things coming together. So it's why Pussy Riot just warms my heart. Um, so I know most of you have seen. Have you all seen the performance of them in the church that got them arrested, that ended them up in jail? Yeah. No. Yeah. Some yeses, some noes. Yeah. So, um, there was a group, what's the name of the group that Pussy Riot was affiliated with that's men and Voina. women? Voina. 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 What? Voina. 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 No, not Femin. Femin's another, well, it's another kind of problematic. We'll deal with some other time of the week. Um, but so Voina is a a mixed gender group of, of Russian artists and activists who have done a series of things. Some of them got a lot of attention, some of them were much more localized. And some women from, who were affiliated with that group and some other women formed Pussy Riot. Um, they were very troubled and critical of the way that the Orthodox Church was becoming a political platform for um, Putin who they felt was a repressive force in Russian society, and so they did a performance in the church. And some of the language, we'll just look a little bit at the lyrics before we go. Virgin Mary, Mother of God, put Putin away, put Putin away, put Putin away. Black robe, golden epaulettes, which are the shoulder pieces. All par parishioners crawl to bow. The phantom of liberty is in, he is in heaven. Gay pride sent to Siberia in chains. The head of the KGB, their chief saint, leads protesters to prison under escort in order not to offend his holiness. Women must give birth and love. Shit, shit, the Lord's shit. Shit, shit, the Lord's shit. Virgin Mary, Mother of God, become a feminist. Become a feminist. Become a feminist. <laughs> The church's praise of rotten dictators, the cross-bearer procession of black limousines, a teacher-preacher will meet you at school, go to class, bring him money. Patriarch Gund Gundiev, Gund how do you say it? Gundiev. Gundiev believes in Putin. Bitch better believe in God instead. The belt of the virgin can't replace mass meetings. Mary, mother of God, is with us in protest. Virgin Mary, mother of God, put Putin away. Put Putin away. Put Putin away. So, their biggest insult is really about Putin, although, of course, it was a challenge to the church. Um, wait, I wasn't even going to show it to you. Hate. Yeah, but we weren't going to go there. Yeah, we'll, we'll, do the, we'll do the pussy. So, they did this, basically, they tried to do the full punk thing. They brought their band, their amps, everything to the church, and they were slowly removed from it. Um, three of them were arrested. One of them was released. Two of them got two-year prison sentences and are in prison right now. Um, Two others left Russia to not end up going to prison and are living in exile somewhere else. I will just show you uh, what happened after the women were the solidarity of the other women in the group. We've been fighting for the right to think, to think, to criticize, to be musicians and artists, ready to do everything, to change our country, no matter the risk. We go on with our musical fight in Russia, and our country is dominated by evil men. These men think it's illegal to call yourself a feminist and to sing punk music. These men think it's illegal to stand up for the rights of the gay and lesbian community. These men think that you can't criticize your government. These men think that if you sing and dance in an inappropriate way, you get Two years in prison. Thank you, Madonna. Thank you, Red Hot Chili Pepper. Thank you, Bjork. Thank you, Green Day. And the gigantic punk feminist thank you to all musicians, activists, to everyone around the world who stand up together for fight to our right to be free. Start the pussy right. And never stop. The fight for freedom is an epic battle that is bigger than life. 
Gypsy Riot, in some ways um, repeating some of the text with a punk flavor of Isadora Duncan in 1903. Um, Anne Live Young Mermaid, I'm not sure if I have this up. Um, and it's interesting because I saw Anne Live Young and was totally driven crazy for a while. And then I actually was like, okay, you watch her enough and you listen to other people. And then I had a really long talk with Ishmael Houston Jones once about why he thought she was so great. And then I changed my tune. And so now I'm calling her one of the important bitches of contemporary dance and performance. And she's, I mean, it's, she's, a lot of people think she's a bitch. Uh, fierce is another word we should have introduced earlier with bitch. Because often what bitches are are fierce people who other people can't stand their fierceness. Or, but... Sometimes bitches are actually rude people, too, so. Um, when major festivals and museums are still dominated by white and male artists, Anne Liv refuses to participate in Master's Tools approaches to her art. Her work confronts sexism and racism in difficult and awkward ways, heavily influenced by queer, gay, and black performance and music, while she rejects any containment in the categories of art or political history. Um, Oh, you know what? This isn't going to play. Because I closed. Because they were on Vimeo and I couldn't download them, so I preloaded them on my... I mean, I don't think they'll still be there, right? If I hit Restore Previous History? No, that's not what I mean. I mean, show... Oh, no. shoot. Couldn't I do Restore? Yes. Will it actually... But it won't be there, right? No, it's no, no, no. So skip that. There's lots of Anne Live Young. What I wanted to show you, so she has this piece, Mermaid. I would have showed you a piece of that just to show you this very difficult relationship she has with audiences. She does not accept many of the standard uh, agreements that we have for the, in the theater. And even though that can be super annoying, you also realize what it means to agree with structures. So those of you who saw Turbulence, um, one of the, the project that I've been involved in the last couple of years that several people who have been here have been involved with, including Hannah, Jesse, and Larry, who were here last week. I am inspired by Anne Liv Young going, what if we don't agree with some of the basic agreements of what people expect when they come to the theater? Like, if we're going to make some tools that are not master's tools, we might need to speak in other languages or try other things that maybe seem annoying or difficult, right? And some people do that by through minimalism or moving very slowly. Other people do that by kinds of maximalism. But in Anne Liv Young's piece, uh, this one, Mary, position one, and I wanted to show it to you only because I'm going to be showing you a bunch of ass video coming up. But uh, what is her name who's worked a lot with uh, Anne Liv Young? Isabel Lewis. Isabel Lewis. So Isabel Lewis is her demo model to show positions that women get fucked in and Anne Liv is naked, just wandering around with a microphone talking the whole time, explaining ways for women to fuck. And then Anne, and then Isabel Lewis is up on a chair with her leg like this, going but much more explicitly and for a period of time. So there's that little image just before we watch some other things. Um, so before we watch the twerk video, which I know that many of you have seen. Um, there's even people online saying, look, it's the original twerk. So this is, Josephine Baker got kind of famous for this banana skirt dance. And it's really the sort of height of exoticism and minstrel in a way. Um, there's only tiny, tiny bits of it on film. So this, you're going to see like 12 seconds. This is in the 20s. <laughs> So, again, one of the things that I want to complicate is who the audience is for black women's asses dancing in your face. Yeah. And that it's actually, there's more than one audience, and my experience is that the people dancing know that. They know that they are being read or seen differently by different people. And they're making choices about how much to play into stereotype in one way, and how much to innovate or celebrate their sexuality and celebrate their body in their own way. So there's just a lot that's going on. Um, is there anyone who has not seen twerking? Like, yeah. 
okay? Because it just keeps getting mentioned a lot. So we'll just, we won't watch the whole video, which you have to have, be of a certain age to even watch on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> so these are the women often being called a bitch in the rest of hip hop. minstrel like how is this a performance of stereotypes um, how is this empowerment how is this a detournement of sexist hip-hop how is this a rejection of colonial Christian puritanism and white aesthetics so how is this a rejection of those things how is this improvised survival how is this appropriating masters tools in terms of the way that the whole industry is used all these questions, so I just want to sort of drop it in so that we see more than we see just on the first level when we're watching these things. Um, I had something else to show you, but I don't know what... Oh, why? Where was Azealia Banks? And why did I want you to see her? That's so funny. Um, I basically went really long. Well, that's how long I was going to go. till 10.30, and it's 10.30. Um, that's some of a history of bitches. Oh, show, show the Azealia Banks. Yeah. Do you all, who knows, who doesn't know Azealia Banks? And there's a number of people who are pretty important in um, sort of queer hip hop right now. Um, and I was gonna show Sissy Bounce stuff and there's actually some really good stuff by um, Big Frida talking about uh, black ass dancing in your face. It's really good on, on YouTube, but it was too much of a sort of another lecture. Um, and Big Frida is a queer hip hop bounce artist from New Orleans. New or bounce is a kind of beat and style that comes from New Orleans. Azealia Banks is, um, is an out queer, very controversial with some people in the United States because of the way that she's using words like faggot and bitch and cunt and the mainstream, which are mostly sort of non-profit, polite, big money, gay and lesbian organizations, have heavily criticized her, which then she has just come right back and been like, fuck you, you big gay organizations never did anything for me anyway. So, um, and there are people trying to distance themselves from her. But I think you'll see things like she doesn't front, she's not, um, She's not fronting a certain kind of sexuality. She's not playing into the role of a, a woman in hip-hop. She's not twerking for you. Um, and yet she's working a very sexy, coy thing at the same time. I don't know if you'll, be able to, if you'll get all the lyrics, but... Hey, I can 
leave the answer. I'm ready to dance when the bear bar. Then when they hit that dip, get your camera. You can see even that bitch shit the camera. bar. In the league that your sister be in. The bitch who wants to compete. And I can freaking fit that pump with the beat. And you know what your bitch will become when her weep in. I just wanna fit that punch with your beat in. Sit in that bunch, it gets me in. Kick it with your bitch who come from Parisian. She know what to get my pump in the season. Now she wanna lick my pump in the evening. And put that tongue tongue to deep in. I guess that cut get in the end. We'll only translate that one thing. Is everyone getting what she's what the sort of chorus is? Yes. I guess that cunt getting eaten. And again, um, right? Do we need to say why that's important? Is having a hip hop song so, and how few actually say that? Right. Again, it's about how this language is being used and then what she's talking about. But when you think about how how infrequent it is that that's the sort of way that the line goes. You know what's up or don't you? We're gonna do it, y'all. I'm a rude bitch, so what are you made of? Oh, I'm gonna eat your food up, dude. I could bust your eight. I'm gonna do one, too. Fuck it, gun, dude. I'm gonna get you make bucks. So I'm gonna look right there. I'm gonna let you do one, too. Fuck. Fuck, I'm gonna give you one, too. Come, you gave me the cover. I'm gonna do one, dude. Cock, I'm licking in the water. About to live out you. Cock, the warm dude. Make a do-rack, too, son. Nigga, you're a Kool-Aid, dude. Plus, your bitch might drink it. I'm gonna do let you. Come to one, too. What'd you do to Kool-Aid, son? I'm gonna ruin you, cunt. That's what she says to him over and over. Yo, yo, I heard you riding with the same tall.